This episode of the podcast is supported by Audible. You can download and listen to the world's best storytelling. I use it all the time to and from work. You can listen to audiobooks, original series and more on their free app. To get your free 30-day subscription, which includes a free book, click on the link in our show notes and enjoy. Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff. I hope you enjoy it. Please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool, I'm alive. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. So um, today I've got the pleasure of being virtually joined by Kerry Ann Payne, born in South Africa. She's a British swimmer and she does marathon open water swimming. Um, God knows why, but we'll find out. And long distance freestyle in the pool. And she's two time. 10k open water champion, Olympic silver medalist, and um, doing some really, really cool things. So look forward to hearing about it. Kerry ann welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's always nice to see people face to face, so even kind of that face to face conversation. <laughs> Definitely. So whereabouts are you at the moment? Oh, so we're in London, I guess, as everybody else is doing is, is living through the, the lockdown at the minute. Crazy times, eh? Crazy times. I think like two, three weeks ago, we were planning our 10 year work anniversary and all of that stuff. And then the pace of change has been really ridiculous. Yeah, I think it, it definitely has. And actually, um, if I was to try and put, you know, positive spin on my previous experience, it's kind of <laughs> already prepared me for things that might you know, we've always been told to expect the unexpected. That was something um, that a guy called Bill Sweetham, who was the National Performance Director for British Swimming quite a while ago now, 2004 to 2008-ish, around that, that time. And yeah, his motto was basically expect the unexpected. So um, yeah, we've kind of always been, you know, if something unexpected happens, we've gone, right. Okay, what can we do about it? What can we control? What can't we control? And then try to move on from that. Yeah, so you just have to, so it's prepared you just to be calm, under pressure, what, something happens. Your, your, I guess your mood must be so just like calm and steady now. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, just, you've got it. There's, again, there's no point in worrying about the things that you can't. Although having said that, I'm sure there's lots of people who just don't know enough information about you know where they need to be and what needs to happen. Um, but yeah, yeah, if you can try and emotion out of things and try and think about it in terms of uh, what you can control and what you can't control. Now, having said that and hearing myself say that, I've definitely had a few wobbles the last couple of weeks. <laughs> Oh no, this is really. And then you know, after um, Boris, you know, basically locked everyone down. It's definitely a, a sobering moment. Um, but yeah. you know, and that's about just kind of looking into what you can and what you can't control. Yeah. Well, I've started a little gratitude diary. I started it a few weeks ago after we had a sports psychologist come and have a chat with us. Um, but I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I get. I mean, we're locked down, but I can get food delivered to my doorstep. I've got like on-demand entertainment. I've got um, like fully stocked shops in London still. You know, there's a lot to be grateful for. So despite, and we can move and do exercise in the house and, and stuff like that. There's a lot to be thankful for. And uh, my motto for the year is not to worry about things I can't affect. So I'm trying to yeah. work hard on that. Definitely, it's a good motto. Sure. How did you get into swimming? So I, I guess I didn't really have a choice. So my older brother and sister, my brother's nine years older than me, and he uh, he was already swimming and so was my sister. So I was essentially born onto a poolside. Um, I wasn't, actually, but essentially, you know, my mum my was, my mom must've been pregnant when she was taking my brother swimming. And then when she had me, she still had to take him swimming. Um, and I just absolutely idolized him. So it's quite a big gap between the two of us. Um, and I just wanted to do what he was doing and he was swimming essentially. So that's all I wanted to do. Amazing. And, and was this in South Africa? You grew up in South Africa and... Yes. Yeah, so I was born there, lived there until I was 13. And I had been swimming literally from 
the second I possibly could learn how to swim. And my mum made us try everything. She didn't want to just be swimming because, again, by the time I came along, she'd already had at least nine years of my brother doing it and then my sister doing it. And then she was like, please don't please <laughs> no, no, no. Turns out I was a swimmer um, after all that. And um, I would get so upset if uh, she didn't take me training with my brother and sister. So I must have been like eight years old and I'd wake up in tears because I realised she didn't take me morning training. So she took my brother and my sister on my brother morning training. She's like, carry on, you're eight years old. You should be sleeping in your own bed you should not be on a poolside does it but you said you'd agree what, so, what time is morning training i heard that's early for swimming yeah it can be it's about 5 a.m yeah because it's got to be done before school because it's quite a young sport so yeah about 5 a.m yeah crazy so when when were you allowed to go morning training um i think just so that she i would stop crying she basically did it <laughs> I, can't remember. Um, I think it was also ease of trying to navigate three kids into different schools and all that kind of stuff so um yeah. even maybe 10 which is far too early and if anybody's watching this who's got kids that's far too early early so you're taking your kids morning training sleep is really important and um, so make sure they get as much of it as they can but you always hear you hear this kind of mixed thing of like specialize in something you know like for example uh tiger woods right i mean he was like specialized in golf early on versus like a roger federer whose parents like said don't bother doing tennis and dissuaded him from doing it and obviously became like the best so it's quite it's, it's quite interesting isn't it that the specialism versus like just try loads of things and maybe you then navigate yeah it's a really tricky one because i guess i've seen um through the years loads of different people and families trialing the different routes and actually the ones yeah. whose parents forced them to specialize in something from a young age ended up not carrying on so they were brilliant athletes and really good at swimming um, but they got to maybe like 14 and they that when they felt like they could rebel they rebelled and they were that, that's it i'm done i'm not i'm leaving this anymore and you just knew that they had like incredible potential um and then we've seen from the other side of the spectrum so i guess my parents were not actively asking me not to swim but you know <laughs> they wouldn't take me um and then said, when i got a bit older i would have to wake them up um in the morning so that was kind of the new rule was right, you're gonna wake yourself up if you want to go you better wake me up and get me up and enough time to get to training and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah amazing when when did it like switch for you that you wanted to like really pursue a profession well i guess it's not professional right but well, it's yeah prof it's amateur technically yeah. but yeah we're yeah. kind of everything we do is in a professional manner so we're training yeah. all the stuff that you know professional athletes would be sacrificing um and you know missing parties and family friends and you know weddings and baby showers and all yeah. that stuff um and you know training 25 hours a week minimum um wow. on top of that so i had i never i don't think i ever chose a moment where i was like right this is it i was just always i just loved it so much but for me swimming was about being the best athlete i could be it wasn't about necessarily being on the top of the podium it was about doing what i could do how could i be the best athlete possible and racing was a, an opportunity to see how i was progressing well you know was i getting any better um how was i doing but essentially for me it was mainly about being the best athlete that i could be essentially which is why i loved training so much because every session had a clear purpose and it was either contributing or not contributing to me being a better athlete. Yeah. And did that, did, did that happen right from the beginning? So you, you, during school and, or did it, once you, once you'd hit a certain level, then the coaches got better, the training become more, became more sophisticated and. It was definitely a combination of both, <laughs> I think. And I definitely had ups and downs. Of curve. And, yeah. you know, when I was, I just wanted my brother and sister to basically say, well done and congratulate me. So yeah. it, it was more for them, I guess. Um, and then when they kind of stopped swimming and then it was just me, it kind of, I had a bit of a lull and I, I, the way I describe it is that when I was a kid, I was always just looking forward. I didn't care who was next to me, racing me. Like if there was six foot or 14 and I was eight, I didn't care less. It was about just going yeah. forward. Then when I got a bit older, sort of, I kind of started looking behind me and I kind of knew that that wasn't the right thing to do and the right way to do it. And then, uh, yeah, probably about 18 and I was like, right, this is not working for me anymore. I'm, something's not right. I need to make sure I'm focusing again on, on me and what I can control and what I can't control. Yeah, yeah. So again, back to mindset. Yeah. What, what, did they have like, they had sports psychologists to work with you at that at that moment? Yeah, yeah. they had. We've had sport. We've been very lucky with British Swimming um, and UK Sport yeah. to support England, actually, um, and the English Institute of Sport. A um, um, combination of all those guys have made sure that we had everything that we needed. Uh, sports psychologists, through to physios, through to doctors, uh, anything that we needed really to make sure that we were always on top of our game. Um, and you use right. them as and how you need them. So it's not like every single week I'm going to go and see a physio, but if I yeah. needed it and it was something that was going to be um, going to benefit my performance, and um, that was going to happen. And the same with the sports scientist, I'm um, sorry, with the sports psych. 
um, if we needed him or needed them, then there was always going to be someone there for us. Why did you decide to do to go crazy and do these marathons and like long distance swimming? So I was always a long distance swimmer anyway, from kind of being quite young. And unfortunately, okay. that isn't something I got to choose. <laughs> that was very much just my the makeup of my body. And um, right. if I couldn't, I 100% would have been sprinting. <laughs> but I'm definitely a long distance athlete. There's not a huge amount of fibers um, running through my body, unfortunately. So I knew I was definitely better at the longer the longer the event, better I used to doing it. Um, and I would, you know, there was, I remember with my, the first coach that I had when I came to the UK, a guy called Dave Crouch, um, who was up in Rochdale, it was Rochdale Aqua Bears. Um, I had fond memories of that. And he used to tell me that there was this um, test that you, because I used to try and convince him that I was a sprinter because I'd moved <laughs> and I was like, well, he won't know. I'll be a sprinter for a while. Um, and try to convince him. He was like, there's a test that we can do, carry on to tell whether you're a sprinter or not. And I was like, mm, okay, right, we'll see. And he's like, right, basically you're going to float on your back. And if you float on your back and you stay up, you're a distance swimmer. And if you sink, then you're a sprinter. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, fair enough. <laughs> Sounds easy enough. Anyway, I lay there. I was like, have you started yet? And he was like, I'm already, I'm already convinced. Because I literally, I, I was just flat on the water like that. And I was like trying to get my legs to sink down, but there was, <laughs> there was none of it. <laughs> Crazy. And what's so um, so long distance swimming is is it from ten k ten k on or? So in um in the pool, the furthest distance that you can go is pretty much a is an eight hundred for women, and they're kind of pushing the boundaries now to fifteen hundred because the, the furthest distance right. in the pool for men is a fifteen hundred meters. Um, so yeah. they they are kind of moving that so that the men and women are doing the same distance. Um, and then if you want to go any further than that, then there's a definite choice that you have to choose. So it was uh, just after the Commonwealth Games in two thousand and six where I had a couple of bad years. I came fourth at that competition. I had a terrible time. I wasn't enjoying it anymore. Um, and my coach was like, right, something needs to change. So you've got two options. You can either completely change the event for a while and do the 400 medley, which is doing two strokes of, um, two lengths of each stroke in Sheffield, or we've got an opportunity to change events completely and go to a 10K out in Australia. And I was like, I was like 400 in Sheffield, 10K in Australia. I'm going to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, my first 10k and I qualified for the world championships um for, awesome. the next, for the next year so yeah it kind of was like oh right okay here we go I'm a 10k swimmer now and then yeah moved on from there and this is open water swimming now yeah yeah so then you yeah. move on water swimming so that's um doing a 10k in a pool is, is not an option <laughs> in a race definitely not too many turns um yeah 10k so there's at the Olympics, there's only one event that you can do, which is a 10K and they call it marathon swimming. And then oops, there's a couple of different, there's a 5K, there's a 10K, there's a 25K. It's like five and a half, six hours of swimming. It's abs I've never done one, never will do one. It's far too far. That's but yeah, crazy. there are some great athletes out there that do 25K. Crazy. So you kissed the pool goodbye and then you went open water 10k and you and you found your your thing yeah so i kind of um there was no pressure on me because it was a brand new event i didn't know anything about it beijing was the first time yeah. that opened in the olympics uh -huh. um and my coach the day you know that you're one of the fastest in the water um in a sprint uh, over you know like the sprinter distances um yeah. so if you can be anywhere near the top for the last thousand meters then you're a shot um but just see how it goes you've got nothing to lose, see how you get on. And at that time, I thought, you know, this would be the only Olympics I potentially ever go to. Yeah, and then I, I started the swim and I came out with a silver medal and it was kind of like, yeah, you're an open water swimmer now. Let's carry on. <laughs> Let's crack on with the next. Congratulations. What was the, what was the journey like? So, so did you... Thank you. Like how, long, how long did you have to train from when you decided you wanted to do the, uh, the, the 10K event? to to the event you had like a year or two or was it oh it's training um training doesn't ever really stop so we tr we pretty much train for 50 weeks of the year we get two weeks off after the major meet in summer and actually the training for a 10k in the 800 although there's a, a longer distance in in between the actual event the training is quite similar and um, i didn't need to change a huge amount and i had been training but at that point i've been training for at least sort of eight years anyway um, and yeah. so I was definitely ready to take on a new challenge. I didn't have to change drastically. What I did need though was experience, the open water experience. So actually going out, doing open water swims and dealing with the fight that happens in and amongst that yeah. and just figuring out what the tactic was. So knowing, uh, so for Beijing, yeah. Team GB, we were the first ones to um, pull swimmers into the open water. So we knew that we were the fastest ones, but we needed to figure out how we could, in terms of speed on, on paper, we needed to figure out how we maximize yeah. that. Um, and then myself and, and Cassie, because my teammate, um, she, we both basically had the same plan, which was to, you know, we definitely had a high threshold, um, but we knew that if we could tire everyone else out for the last thousand meters, we had a pretty good shot of doing of doing well. And that's kind of how the race panned out. 
um, although we got to the last 100 meters, I think, before anybody passed us. Um, but yeah. Amazing. But only one person, only one person passed you in the end. Yes, only one, only one Russian person passed me <laughs> at the end. Amazing. What was your what was your like nutrition program like? Um, nutrition had never really been a massive thing for me. I mean, I always tried to eat as well as I could. Um, but when I was like in school and training in school and all that kind of stuff, the nutrition wasn't necessarily something that was forced down our throats. I knew at home I was getting good home cooked meals and my coaches were happy with that. Yep. Um, and then at school, I was buying my own school lunch. And um, when I think back now, I don't quite know how I managed to survive on this, <laughs> but my school lunch was pretty much every single day involved around sausage rolls and chips, <laughs> which is absolutely mental. Oh. Considering I was and you still like, had the energy to train. Competitions. Crazy. I did, yeah. I don't quite know how, and I would not recommend that for anyone. <laughs> um, but when I, you know, the Olympics became very much in, in the in the foreground of what I was doing, yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely had, nutrition for me was more around race nutrition so what I was going to do when I went into competitions and how was I going to you know we were going to do some carb loading a couple of days before and what I was going to have during the swim so our carbohydrate loading um program essentially is what we were um essentially figuring out uh, okay so and then as, as you got closer did it get a little bit more um scientific or were they it wasn't again it wasn't necessarily scientific because um I, other than sausage roll and chips which I stopped eating when I left school um I had a pretty good diet which was you know very much yeah. based on routine and vegetables and all that kind of stuff so right. no one has ever been concerned my weight had never really changed and I wasn't feeling fatigued yeah. when I was training so there I guess the, the theory was let's not um put an extra strain or an extra pressure on on what she needs to do um yeah. but um or oh, how many more years was that probably 10 years later so it was only my three years before I finished swimming competitively I found out that I was in gluten intolerant um which kind of was good to know but at the same point when I thought back to all the carb loading I had done basically two days before every major competition of my life <laughs> sticking poisonous stuff down my system yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest symptoms was tiredness so um yes yeah, so that was kind of like when i found right. that out but um but yeah it was just one of those things um that you kind of find out you know with more and more people talking about it and having the access to yeah. the, the testing and all that sort of stuff so then from that point on i guess that was 2013 and um, we then started to create you know the new gluten-free carb loading program and, and all that kind of stuff along there oh, amazing amazing so no like kind of plant-based or you had like balanced omnivore style. I mean, my parents are from, from Africa, South Africa. Well, they're from <laughs> for a long time. Um, <clears throat> it's always going to be part of, of our lives. Um, I have done a lot of research and, you know, watched like Game Changers, um, the oh. documentary on Netflix. And it was interesting, very interesting. Um, yeah. I found it a little bit one-sided. There wasn't quite enough for both sides. But, you know, there was a lot of sound advice that they were talking about in there. So from that, I've definitely tried to make my life now a little bit more... Um, plant-based but not for the performance gains for me but for for the environment essentially and you know we've got an 18 month old daughter and if I can I was gonna say train her up I didn't mean that at all I can bring her up um not expecting to have me every single meal um and it's yeah. just to have every now and then I think that's going to be ultimately better but otherwise I, I'm not sure I would have I think the nutrition stuff and the strength and conditioning it's it all adds to the confidence of, of an athlete and a, and a swimmer and a, or any athlete really and if you don't feel confident with something or you're unsure of how it's going to play out and um, because every year there was a major competition even it might have been the olympics which is every four years and the world championships every two years there was always a major competition so to trial something out quite drastically and it's not like oh this week i'm not going to have meat and then go into the next you know and be like oh that worked it didn't work it, it all took a lot of time um and at the whilst I was training, it just didn't feel like um, a risk. Essentially, I was willing to take, take on that. Yeah. Front. The other thing, yeah, the game changer stuff. The I think there's a difference also between veganism, which is a, a kind of I'd say an ideology almost, right, um, versus plant based, which is just eating plants and stuff. So I think for me, I don't like anyone pushing stuff on people. Um, and we're all different, right? I mean, your body's different to mine and what, you know, the food you digest, you know. I mean, so, so we're going to have different meal plans and different diets and stuff like that. So I think there just needs to be in a little bit of appreciation. The other interesting thing, I think with this COVID yeah. what's going on, it's almost like the planet is just yeah. saying to us, like, stay at home in your room, chill out, 
Let, let me recover yeah. a little bit. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Definitely, we yeah, it's it's definitely. I think it's definitely. I mean, it's obviously doing some amazing things for the planet in terms of yeah canals in Venice clearing up and um, oh, and then all the planes that were for more. So yeah, I think the planet did kind of go right. <laughs> Sit in your room. It's so funny. They, and then back on the game changers thing, I just um, there's a lot of pseudo science around, and um, you know, I mean, I've got two daughters and they're at school and stuff like that, and you know, you hear people saying, "Hey, meat causes." cancer obesity diabetes you know it's like it doesn't really and it just needs to be good science and yeah. good information and yeah. you know people can choose mm -hmm. you know everyone has got a free choice and, and stuff like that so um i mean that for me i'm i eat a little bit of meat not a huge amount i eat fish vegetables try and keep it healthy um my little mm -hmm. motto is if it's got a nutrition label on the back it's probably not so healthy I'm trying to like, <laughs> I'm trying to eat like fresh stuff and you know things like that, which is really cool. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, yeah, I think there's just, but it starts from such, um, from such an early age, all of that stuff. So yeah. having you know had a baby, and, you know, all the weeks before you have a baby, um, everything you know goes on to how formula-fed babies, um, uh, you know, they lead to being obese, um, and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, no, I've got that, got that. But then when you get into it, and actually as a parent, um, or as a new mum. You kind of hope and expect that you'll be able to do everything that's expected of you and um, and then you actually get into it and you realize it's really not that easy for everyone and we had a terrible time breastfeeding it just didn't work out at all so we ended up you know i expressed for about 12 weeks which is probably too much information um but i felt like i was doing the right thing for her and then she was you know topped up within that and you know whenever i went to the clinic to talk to someone about it it was definitely a oh uh, you know you just if you just persisted a little bit longer you know it would have been okay it would have been okay and i was like you have no idea what was going on down there you have, you can't even going on and i made the right call and i've done it and once i've made the call and made the decision it didn't matter what anybody had said but in the in the emotions of having a new baby and dealing with no sleep and you know it's 3 a.m in the morning and she's basically screaming the house down and i gave her some formula stopped and i was like right okay that's kind of something again it's it's not forcing anything down anyone's throat but yeah when it starts from there and then you think about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing so yeah it's just about picking what you feel is the right thing to do and sticking by your guns 100 100 my, my wife's a women's health physio and so um and we've always had two kids so we're all into this stuff but you get a lot of you get a lot of people that are really preach the can only breastfeed formula is really bad you've got to do this you've got to do that you've got to do that and when it's when it's your first kid you get so there's so much information and there's so many things you feel you need to do this and but i mean formula is great now i mean you know uh, your kid can get like all the nutrients it needs so again it's like it's what works for you you know everyone's different in the end was a fed baby is a happy baby so how have they <laughs> yeah, definitely that's very true that's so true so what have you done i know you've done loads what have you done since um swimming or since professional uh, swimming yeah so I um so I was in a pro professional somewhere um, as you call it so I went to three Olympic Games and through those three years, Olympic Games wow three wow. Olympic Games Beijing and then I went to London and then to Rio as well yeah. and which was your favorite oh they were all special in their own way Beijing was my first one coming home with a medal um was amazing but when we went to London uh, my venue was Hyde Park the Serpentine um it was yeah. a free venue which so many people were saying I didn't get any tickets but my event was free so I was like come down and watch the open water and there was thirty thousand watching watching the 10k wow. which is incredible four years previous before Beijing, I had to explain to everybody what it was. Um, but yeah, right. literally, um, you know, four years down the line, there's 30,000 people that came to watch. Um, and it just was amazing. Like, I mean, I'm sure like 50 people were there for the other 23 girls that were in my race, but you know, it felt like 29,900 there to watch me swim. Just incredible. It really was absolutely amazing. Um, and that noise, I will never forget, definitely still makes me feel quite special when I think about the noise when I came out and they said, I'm from Great Britain, carry on pain. And I, you know, waved to everyone and I was like, whoa, no, no, game face, game face, back in the game, get back in the game. And then Rio, really, really, really favorite cities in the whole world. And I've traveled there a couple of times before. And when I found out that Rio was going to be an Olympic um, host city, I thought, you know, the only place they can do the open more so surely has to be the Copacabana, which is exactly where it was. And I was like, I need to be there. I need to do that. And I just love it. It's an amazing country. And the Rio Olympics for yeah. me was, was incredible. Amazing. What a great experience yeah. to have. Yeah, no, it was amazing. Absolutely. But I guess the point I was making about that was through those years, I saw lots of my swimming friends that retired, whether it was their choice or through injury or through illness or 
through not making teams and all that kind of stuff and just kind of saw the impact that it had on a lot of them and um, my husband was my great kind of role model for me so he was also a swimmer also went to three Olympic Games so his first one was Athens then Beijing and his last one was London um, and from Beijing London he basically decided that he was going to do something alongside swimming so that when he finished and he knew he was finishing in London he had a plan to step into um so he did a, a coaching a degree essentially while he was um you know it took him four years to do it and he got experience at the same time while he was doing it so that when he finished in London he had a job to step into and for me to see that and to see how he transitioned from being an elite athlete um I kind of wanted to have the same thing I didn't want to see what well, I saw so many of my other friends who finished going, you know, kind of getting depressed and not really knowing what to do and, you know, or expecting like, right, come on world, I'm an Olympian, what you got from me really doesn't yeah. work that way um, <laughs> at all. So we made sure that before I retired, so I knew I was going to finish in Rio. Um, so a year yeah. before that, we set up a business called Triscape, which is my, uh, kind of my, my baby, um, which is, revolves around coaching. So swimming coaching so my husband does business coaching but I do swimming coaching um, yeah. and, and we keep people one-to-ones we do master classes as well helping people learn how to swim and, and people get better at swimming and then we do retreats um, as well around the world which is all very much on hold at the moment um, but yeah I still am trying to work on how I can still inspire people to swim even though we're obviously not able to get out and about but we'll get there soon we'll get there soon yeah <laughs> we'll definitely get, we'll get, how was the transition for you mentally um, which you, obviously you had you had something to go into you I guess prepared yourself you'd seen your husband's do it was it still quite difficult mentally to like stop doing your 25 hours a week training and no no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. by that point um, I knew I was making the right decision because I uh, probably about three months before and um, the Olympic Games I was driving to training one mor- morning going oh I can't wait to not have to do this again and I was like oh <laughs> I've heard myself or never allowed myself to say that before and I was like I can't wait to not have to do this anymore and I was like oh no that is not where I need to be game but keep it keep keep your check on it and so yeah, as soon as I'd finished that last like my last training session before my race I knew that was my last training session and actually had a little mini celebration um I think my coach was happy about that I'm not, <laughs> not really too sure but she was there anyway and then yeah I just knew it was going to be the last thing for me and actually it's it's really nice not having to get up at 5 a.m and something I still catch myself doing every now and then it's definitely happening less frequently now but when I yeah. when I stopped, I trained every day. I needed to leave the house by three p.m. Um, and I now still know at like two forty-five or two fifty because I was usually late. Um, two fifty, I look at the clock and I'm like, oh, 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 I don't have to go training anymore. <laughs> What's that? Oh no, it's okay. It's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't it, must, uh, it must be good training. At least if your kid wakes you up early, at least you're a little bit used to it from the swimming training. But. You'd have thought that, but really, it's not easy. It's not easy. I'm like, I think because I know I don't need to do it anymore. And I'm like, really, yeah. you have 15 years of catching up on sleep to do. <laughs> Go back to bed. Uh, are you what training are you doing now? Are you still swimming mostly, or are you mixing it up a little bit? Mixing it up definitely. So I've actually got into winter swimming. So there was always an assumption because I was winter British. swimming. Yes, because I was British and I was doing open water that I was a cold water swimmer which is not the case right. at all we used to sun around the world um if races were or water was less than 16 degrees races were cancelled so essentially really? we would chase around the world and um, and yeah so the thought of getting into water less than sort of 15 degrees was like uh no um but yeah i kind of needed a new challenge and only literally only the last two months um i started to i made the conscious decision to yeah. do it which is very different from telling you to do it so yes yeah, so i've done in preparation for that um, because our, our, one of our retreats, a new one we were doing this year with Triscape was um, in Tresco, which is the Isles of Scilly. And it just looks absolutely incredible. But it was in April and it was definitely going to be cold. <laughs> so I kind of, there's a little bit of necessity to kind of be ready for that. Um, but I, I absolutely loved it. It's been amazing. So um, a combination yeah. of doing something, it really gives my brain mentality just a real yeah. buzz. And then on top of that, I, I'm just out to the gym um, as well. So doing, but I'm, I'm using Fit at the moment, an app called Fit, which has actually been the best thing for me what is swimming. It? so it's an app and um, that's classes there's virtual classes and it's called fit so it's um uh, f double it and right. it's uh an app that is they've got live classes that you can do the leaderboard with a whole bunch of other people that are there so there's a bit of competition um but they also have like non-live classes that you can do and there's anything from cardio to strength and then rebalance as well so the yoga pilates meditation breathing and all that kind of stuff so there's a whole range of things that you can do and they can create plans for you um, and for me, that's worked 
amazingly well because there's no excuses. I know I have something I can do and I just set it up on the, you know, on the floor at home yeah. and, and kind of get on with it. <laughs> nice. And is it, so, um, so it's like a one-on-one -on -one video, either live or pre-recorded and then you can do it in your living room. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Do you, do yeah. you ever do, um, do you ever go like down to CrossFit gym or a live class or do you prefer being at home on the app? And I used to, I used to do that and I used to really enjoy that. Yeah. But, um, I guess having a baby, you kind of, do um, you, can. you know, there's things that you do, <laughs> there's things that you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'm definitely into it, but I do enjoy going to the gym and doing the classes. It feels yeah. a little bit more, and there's more equipment there, and you know you can use dumbbells if you want and kettlebells and things. Um, yeah, yeah. But I did during the other day, and I did a blaze class, which is essentially a similar sort of thing, but just like everyone's there doing it, and uh, yeah, you're strapped right. up to a heart rate, and it comes up on the screen, and you've got to basically push yourself. And that's when my athlete competitiveness definitely comes out um, in those moments. Yeah, yeah. Again, competing against me, how high can I get my heart rate? Um, which is good, but I end up just being literally a sweaty mess. On the floor <laughs> you yeah. i love that stuff i do a lot of crossfit which is really cool since the lockdown well since the a couple of weeks um they're doing online zoom classes so you can oh. like dial in on zoom which is similar to what we're using in hangouts and um and we have a workout of the day and then everyone does the workout and you can see everyone on the screen and then they're doing like a, a little yoga sesh as well live it's really cool and you like recognize people from the gym you're like oh, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and and it keeps everyone on track and we post our scores uh, it's really cool. I found I've got like almost more sociable being locked down than I than I was before the lockdown. <laughs> definitely, definitely more phone my mum every day and speaking to people I've been yeah. for ages. Mine too. Um, yeah, it's definitely uh, a positive, and the situation is is more communication with people yeah. and you know more these like hangouts and zooms and FaceTime and stuff. It's it's easier to do that because you're not running off to the next thing. You're like, oh well, fancy a FaceTime. <laughs> yeah, um, and we definitely. actually FaceTime with my family. So I've got a brother and sister, like I said, and my mum and dad. So mum and dad were at home. It was Mother's Day actually. Uh, mom and dad were at their house at her house with her two kids who are young um, and then my brother was at his house with their two kids and we were away with, with Josephine and, and it was literally like being actually all in the same house because it, it was chaos there was noise everywhere kids screaming running around and that's just what it actually is like when we're all together yeah. um, it's really cool the only thing i find now is that you actually have to speak you know because if you're face to face i found everyone was on their phones all the time you know like yeah. on social media on instagram taking selfies and part of the name of my podcast don't take out your phone was the fact yeah. that i used to see my mates and my family and no one would speak because everyone's on the phone. Whereas now you're like arranging to have a video call with your family and actually like you have to have a chat with them. <laughs> you have to yeah. speak. It's got quite, quite, quite social now. It's really funny. Um, what are you doing now with to your training um, swimming coaches now as well? Yes. So um, through our sort of uh, swimming retreat business, which was me coaching people how to swim and yeah. one-to-ones and things we kind of along that journey realized that swimming coaching and certainly swimming for adults in the uk or around the world is just not done very well um because adults are different you need to approach adults in a very different way and when we look back at how people are being taught how to swim we realize that there's a lot of things that are fundamentally wrong and um, just the doing things because that's the way that they've been done for such a long time and what we decided to do was take everything we knew about swimming just forget all of it and actually look at the things that you can't argue with, with science. So the psychology of the brain, biomechanics of your body and the physics, how you move in the water. So we use Newton's law quite a lot. Um, you know, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you're pushing your arms that way, your body will be going in the opposite direction that way. So if you want to swim in a straight line, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You need to be pulling in a straight line, but your body needs yeah. to be doing a whole bunch of sway. So the first thing that we work on with everyone is breathing. Um, and that is, you know, so many people think, oh yeah, I'm an adult now, I'm breathing. But actually when you come to water, so many people don't know the best way, the right way to do it. Um, and they're essentially hyperventilating themselves. It's like they're sprinting up a hill, um, holding their breath essentially, which you can't do for very long. So through the whole process, we realized that there was a need for something um, more of a coaching approach to the way that you teach people how to swim. And that's when we came up with straight line swimming, which does what it says on the tin, <laughs> um, you know, making sure you swim in a straight line. Um, and then through all of that as well, I was approached by the Swimming Teachers Association to do, um, or to help them create an open water coaching qualification, which I jumped at the chance to. Um, and I don't think they were quite expecting me to get as involved as I did. But yeah, I said, <laughs> you know, if you want involved, I need to fully be involved in it. Um, I want to contribute towards it. And if there's something in there that I don't 
it feels right, then we need to talk about it and figure out the best way through. So yeah, literally dive straight into that. And I'm incredibly proud of that um, qualification. And up to date, um, I've qualified really? 123 coaches um, in two wow, years. Wow, congratulations. Is... That's really good. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really loving it. And the new challenge, um, so I had my first course was meant to be the middle of April, and then I had another one at the end of April. So essentially I had four courses between now and May, and the end of May. Yeah. Um, so what we've tried to do, as everybody is trying to do at the moment, is trying to make it as virtual as we can. So it's a three-day course, um, usually involving classroom and practical stuff. And um, so thankfully the STA have worked together with all the tutors to figure out a way that we can do two days online learning. Um, and then when we can, and they have to do so again, we can do a third day practical in person in open water, um, and then we can qualify people that way. So it's going to be tricky and a bit different, but that's kind of where we're at at the moment. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to get in the water, I guess. Although this is probably bro science, but they say chlorine kills the uh, kills the virus, but <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Or not. I think it's perfect. Yeah, there's so many different things out there at the moment. But yeah, the water, the chlorine, like the chlorination, I don't know if that's yeah. the right word or not, but the levels be perfect um, in the pool and it's, uh, yeah, I know, not worth getting involved in now, but yeah, no, there we are. No, no. <laughs> So they'll all have their they'll all have their class their class based education and in a few months time dive straight back into it and, uh, and yeah I mean my, my mission with straight line swimming and, and try to as well is to empower the world to swim and um, and I was doing that well enough myself um you know you know yeah. coaching people I've coached almost two thousand people how to swim which is amazing or I've been a small part of two thousand people's um, swimming journeys but I you know, the, that's not the world. I want to, you know, I've got ambitions to make sure that it can go worldwide. So I yeah. uh, made sure that I had the opportunity to do that by now. If I coach, you know, if I'm qualifying coaches to do it the same way that I'm doing it, then, you know, if, if all those 123 just coach one person or two people, that's, you know, 200, 300, 400 people down the line. And ultimately it will go hopefully worldwide. I guess if the virtual stuff works quite well, and um, then I could maybe do some virtual stuff and then go over to other country yeah. for country yeah. for a couple of qualified people up that way. So there's definitely yeah. lots and lots of scope. And um, through again, through the process, we we have created online learning platforms. So CPDs, um, as you might yeah. have heard them before, of our straight line swimming method, front crawl. So there's three parts, breathing and then your body position, and then motion of your arms and legs. Um, and that's through the Swimming Teachers Association's website, but anybody can do them. Um, you know, so what okay. I'm doing is encouraging people to try and do this. So we've made our breathing one free of charge and the other two are, are, are heavily discounted as well. So even though this is not the best time for actually going out and swimming, the breathing stuff you can every day you can practice it in the bath as well actually um which will give you something else to do for some part of your nice. day um, and then how can people how can people find these courses that is it, um is an app or website that they can go to to sign up yeah it's a website so if you had to um if you had to straightlineswimming.com um there'd be yep. a couple of blog line cpds so if you click on any of those and um, we'll also put a banner up as well so that um people know that they can click through that and it's there so it's a free you just sign up to the STA, it's a free membership, and then you just add the CPD to your online account and you can learn how to swim in the comfort of your own home. Amazing. Awesome work. What can people do, do you think now, any tips to just stay healthy until they can actually get out? Because obviously you can't go into the pool, you can do a little run, um, you're using your app. Are there any, any bits of advice that people can like easily implement while they're at home? Yeah, I think it's just trying to get into a routine that can work for you as quickly as you can. So yes, the novelty of staying in your pyjamas all day might seem like a good idea and you might do that for a few days but very quickly it gets very boring so if you can still try and get up at the same time that you used to have a shower like you used to do your hair like you used to um have breakfast you know even if it means you've got to go out walk around the garden and then come back in that's your commute um to work yeah. uh, then you work for a bit and then you do the commute back to lunch and the commute back to work again in the afternoon yeah. and then you plan it's your true. weeks <laughs> exactly you plan your weeks like you used to if you used to go to crossfit yeah. on monday night yeah you still can try and do that same sort of thing Thing at that time um, and I would definitely recommend you know going outside for that walk or run or cycle that um, the government are saying can do because fresh air and it's starting to get a little bit warmer as well the vitamin d is definitely going to help people um, and then the tricky thing after that is so you know keep get a fitness routine make sure it fits within your day um, and then also just trying to eat as well as you can again for the first few days I'm sure people are basically trying to eat their, all the snacks that they'd, um, <laughs> they'd bought and um, if you can trap it into what was a normal working day for you so like I said you could only you know set rules aside things like you 
can only eat in the garden or something. So, you know, it's a bigger thing than just going to the kitchen, getting your agar crisps and yeah. going back to, you know, you, you can only eat outside or you can only eat when there's the, I don't know, a two in front of something. I don't know, whatever. Pick some rules and, and yeah. try and stick with as much as you can. That's so true. I, 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 hate, I hate getting, I hate working from home. I always get distracted by the fridge constantly, like looking in, seeing what's going on. So I've, I've been yeah. like that, actually. I've been really strict. I'm doing intermittent fasting at the moment, um, which it feels quite, I feel really good on that. So I don't have breakfast. I kind of eat at 7 p.m. and then I start eating again at about 12, 1. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I'm kind of sticking to that because I was doing that five days a week while I was at work. So I'm sticking to that. Um, I'm diarising my exercise. I diarise what work I've got to do. So I'm keeping quite structured doing my little walks yeah and the weather at the moment is like beautiful so a little walk yeah. in the garden and cruise around so no it's good it's important to keep that structure for sure yeah and probably the last thing which i'm not particularly doing very well myself <laughs> right is um, stick to the alcohol consumption that you would do in a normal week. So if you wouldn't normally drink during the week, then try and stick to that if you can, um, you know, and have your virtual hub with your friends on a Friday night. But again, like I said, I'm not really sticking to that very well myself, but that's definitely something if you can start thinking about, because um, if you're having lots of alcohol, you're probably not gonna be sleeping so well, if you're not sleeping so well, it's all going to kind of come for so you don't want to get up in the morning you don't want to do that and you want to just eat all the snacks that you've got in your, in your kitchen okay. so yeah there's a lot that you can do to yeah. try and help you and um, but it's very easy to fall into the things that aren't going to help you as well very true my last my last little thing is um i try not to watch or read any news until like well after lunch because like having a diet of negative news yeah. for breakfast is not good for your mind so i'm trying to like just take care of all that stuff and positive speak to positive people surround yourself with positive people and uh, good for the mind yeah uh, one thing we were basically just waiting until um the announcement came from the government so whether that was 5 p.m or whether that was as it was last night half eight um and yeah. just that's the thing that i've been looking at because everything else is kind of speculation until boris says it we don't really know what's real and what's not real and then the next day doing any research i needed to on what he said so yes, um, okay. yeah no point in reading any of those websites <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't, read the website, don't read social media and also get people I, what really annoys me at the moment is you're getting people forward stuff saying like my yes. mate works my mate's a doctor my mate's uh you know here's like an some audio yes. clip from my mate who's working at the hospital um i think for me like if you don't know the source don't forward it on you know like know them personally yeah. otherwise don't, don't forward, forward it on, on. Yeah. Because i just cut all that out um that's important yeah, yeah. carry on great to speak to you thank you so much for um for coming on uh next time um i'm really looking forward to like meeting you in person and we can do an actual like face to face which would be which would be cool yeah. and we can like recap on yeah. what happened the last three or four months or whatever um but i hope you stay safe healthy yeah. all that you stuff thank you you too and same thank to all you very much well. and um yeah speak to you soon hey folks thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places